Go ahead, Gavin, and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Gavin Weinshine with NG, uh, civil engineer background. Um, just going to have a little chat today about kind of some of the stuff that we've been working on here. And before we launch, uh, Gavin, I did want to make one announcement. Sorry. Um, in case people don't stay on the call, we have uh, Rob Davis, Fresh Energy, who is going to come on the show, SolarWorks for Illinois, on October 28th. So mark your calendar. You can go to seco.com, C E C C O.com forward slash solar webinar. You can find the registration page, or if you just Google Seco. Uh, space Rob Davis, you'll find the landing page. So you do have to register to uh, to get on that, but it's a free event on October 28th. All right, uh, I want to thank Gavin for being here. Uh, I really appreciate your time, Gavin. And with that, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Yeah. So thanks for having me today, guys. I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little background. Um, so. I guess I've been, my background has been in sustainability kind of back before it was a buzzword. Um, I live in Chicago, based out of Chicago, um, kind of working on building projects and things like that before coming to renewable energy about six years ago. Um, and so the pollinator habitat was just sort of something that we used on a regular basis in large areas that we didn't want to maintain on different projects that I was working on. and when. When I joined NG, which was formerly called SoCor Energy, um, we were only a rooftop solar company. And then as we expanded into a ground mount solar, um, I guess the big question was, is just kind of coming from a completely different industry, it was what do we plant beneath these solar arrays? And I guess being like a, because we all kind of came from a different, different industries, we sort of started looking at things a little differently. Um, and so we kind of saw this great like symbiotic relationship between the use of potentially private money to do some public good and it could be beneficial like kind of on both sides. So I'm just going to kind of run through what we've been working on. It's been about six years now um, since we started and so basically uh, nearly anything that we've done since we've actually like in the last six years has been what we call ecological services is kind of the most recent word we've used to describe it, which is just vegetating each site according to where it's located and what we can do from an environmental perspective. So um, today I'm going to focus mostly just on kind of the pollinator approach, um, very much related to kind of the Midwest, Illinois. Um, so I'm just going to kind of walk through some of that. And so I think I think we're all kind of aware of the benefits and the environmental need and kind of understanding that you know we're carting billions of bees all over the country every year we've got nutrient rich soils being washed away in our fields we've got stormwater issues flooding um a lack of habitat loss of you know insect populations and habitat for other animals um and so there's just this really you know a lot of water you know in i guess like damage to our streams and waterways and so this is just a kind of a quick list of sort of what we want to run through is like the different potential benefits um, of kind of taking this approach beneath solar arrays. Um, currently, we're managing about 50 sites um, and about 800 acres over the past six years that are all pollinator friendly habitats. And so we've really kind of focused on kind of the native plus pollinator friendly. And there's other ways to approach it um, that I think are arguably just as important. It just kind of depends on, that's kind of why we try to use a more general term like environmental services, because it's really about doing what, you, doing what your site is asking you to do and kind of listening to the community and the surrounding environment. Um, and so this is one of our sites in Vermont. It's a very cool, like very like well-performing site. And you'll learn that not all of them are like this. Um, it takes a lot of work to get to this point, um, but this is a site that's up in Vermont. Um, I'm sure Rob with Fresh Energy will probably tell you about this as well. This, he was, I believe yesterday or the day before, um, they used the honey from this site to create a beer up in Vermont um, called Honey Bunch and it was just released on the 21st. Um, this, is, this is that site. Um, so kind of what we've been doing from an approach is I guess that the challenge that we've had here is that we have sites like all over the country. So this is just a quick image kind of showing where all the different projects are amongst wind, utility scale, and distributed solar throughout the country. 
Um, some of these sites are projects that SoCore Energy did not develop. So it's since we've been purchased by NG um, at the beginning of, I guess at the end of last year. Um, so we've kind of inherited some of these sites and we're working on converting some of them as we can and kind of working through that. Um, so one of the biggest things that I, I just kind of wanted to talk about, like the challenges that we're running into and just, I guess the, the lessons learned. Um, one of the biggest things is just, it's very important to plan ahead and find quality partners, um, great seeds that come from a, you know, the right location, the right origin. Um, and then working with your different experts to really plan ahead through, before the project's completed and not just waiting till the end. Um, I can't stress kind of how important it is. I, I, the success is doubled just by doing by putting in that time at the beginning. Um, one of the other tactics that we've taken is like all of our panels are raised um, at least 36 inches or higher off the ground to allow for a more diverse like seed mix. Um, the industry, there's kind of always been this sort of pitch from the racking manufacturers, like just all this like, kind of talking about how they can reduce the embedment of depth of the steel and less steel means less cost. Um, but if you really look at the numbers, um, some of the calculations that I've done, just to give you an example, an entire megawatt of solar, which is about four to seven acres, depending on the racking type, to raise it an additional foot is probably only going to cost somewhere between $2,500 and $3,500. And so that can easily be saved on literally one to two maintenance visits over the 25 year lifespan of the project or 35 year. And so I think it's a pretty good argument that raising these higher and using a more, you know, diverse vegetation that can withstand like the years of change and um, different climate. Um, I guess just as the climate changes over the years, I think it just makes a lot of sense. And so it's just kind of one of the tactics we've had because I've kind of had, I've had some calls from companies in Georgia, for example, that have, you know, the panels that are eight inches off the ground and they're asking and looking for a pollinator mix and one just doesn't exist, right? <laughs> um, so just some other thing is just the, the biggest thing to understand is that it is, this is a large investment um, as far as time and energy at the beginning, initial stages of the project. So it's, you really need to understand that it takes, you know, three to four years for, to get quality establishment. And you're gonna have sites that perform great. And then you're gonna have sites that are what I call the black sheep of the family. Um, you know, this is an example of one that performed very well. I mean, this literally in one and a half growing seasons turned into a pretty decent uh, selection of pollinators. It's a lot of like the early vegetate, like the early species, but um, you know, we just had some great growth in this one. And then we've got sites where you've got erosion issues and challenges. And so you can see that projects like this take a lot longer to get developed and to get, and to get established, I guess. Um, one of the critical things is just making sure that you keep the nutrient rich soils on site by planting cover crops and taking care of your site during construction. Um, you can see even this site, like in August 2017, this site was completely planted prior to construction beginning, but you can see how quickly that is destroyed, especially it seems that all solar projects end up being constructed in the late fall, which I still have yet to figure out. Um, but we can't seem to move our construction schedules earlier. Um, so this is some other problems that we've seen. Um, a lot of erosion issues. Um, just it's really important to think about the timing and planning ahead and using erosion mat as necessary. You can see simply how much sand and or how much soil we lost. So there's a nice, you know, $75,000 worth of seeds at the bottom of that hill right now. Um, so these are very costly mistakes. And so it's just really important to spend time and energy putting it into your plan. One of the other interesting things that I just wanted to kind of bring up is uh, one of the things I was surprised with is sort of the initial response from the community, adjacent landowners and things is, is it's really, it's really important to set like their expectations of kind of what your plan is here. Like this is not going to look like a manicured golf course, for example, and just kind of setting those expectations at the beginning has like almost entirely erased any kind of opposition it's just we just really need to plan ahead and let the community know what to expect um, and you know you can see that the road on the picture on the right um, 
you know that's that to me is actually a success like it doesn't need to be a perfectly manicured road and I think just helping um, just the community understand that will avoid a lot of kind of issues from different stakeholders and stuff because this is where I, this is the you know this, everything is habitat like that's the goal at the end of the day is actually to create habitat that's useful and useful at the right times of the year um, kind of along those lines is the last thing we want to do is we have to is you know as this vegetation grows from a developer's perspective the most important thing for us is the production but being mindful that we're also trying to create habitat here so if vegetation is starting to grow like to a point that is slightly above the panels, um, like one of the things we do is just selective mowing. So we just mow just a strip in front of the panels so that we're not removing all the habitat and all of the environmental impacts. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, this is just a fun little video I thought I'd share. This is a mower that we bought in Switzerland and had like kind of basically makeshift Oh, that didn't work at all. I was afraid of this. Let's try this again. Is it gonna work? Oh, sorry guys. Anyway, you can kind of see it has a it has a robotic arm basically that as it runs into each of the piles along the array, it can actually mow in between. And it's just been a really great tool that's reduced the time and speed and a lot of the you know hand mowing around the different like equipment piles and things like that. Next, yeah, I just wanted to kind of talk noticed, about. Okay. I've noticed that that equipment is available in the Midwest now too. So, uh, oh, if, is it great? If you get roped into uh, maintenance on a solar farm, I think uh, Indiana, you don't have to go far for that uh, swiveling arm or whatever they call that. I bet it's actually the same. So we ordered it from Switzerland, and the guy, I think, probably there was a guy from Indiana who kind of, you know, altered it to basically work with the work with the equipment. So it's probably the same one. Um, so one of the biggest things is that we've talked about like all of the different like benefits that we can see from you know this approach, but the biggest thing is trying to quantify those and to get those kind of bring them to the forefront um, because there's a lot. What I've learned in the industry is that most developers literally don't know what vegetation management costs are um, a lot of the developments are happening whether they're owning long the projects long term or many are selling them is they're throwing a number into some budget at some point with very little knowledge about um, like the understanding of it and so it, that's why it's hard I guess to for s developers that are selling projects to get them to you know put the initial cost in because the, any initial costs that are higher are going to make their their prices higher and they're looking at their profit margins. So it's one of the challenges that we're running into. So we're, our biggest goal is trying to understand and quantify these benefits. And so one of the best studies that um, is working is happening right now. And I, when I say this is just probably one of the larger studies, but there are community groups like even like this, there are hundreds all over the country that I've spoken with that are all kind of working on different avenues and different ways of understanding like the potential benefits here. Um, from you know locating solar and pollinator like next to riparian and wetland areas and just understanding benefits um, there's somebody kind of a, you know applying for a grant that would look at the entire Midwest sort of as if you would look at city planning and layering energy and environment and agriculture all on top of each other to kind of try to see where they overlap and where the positive impacts could be with each other um, to try to kind of influence where projects are developed um, so this, this project is focused on kind of two things. Um, one is what, ve what vegetation is, grows best um, beneath different solar array types and heights um, or, or clearances, um, different soil types, different states, things like that, adjacent to different agricultural um, specific like dependent plants, things like that. So NREL is really kind of focused on the vegetation portion and kind of understanding what the stormwater effects are, if there's a microclimate created under the panels, therefore increasing the efficiency. And then um, Argon is also working on, which is, I, I, this is kind of a slide that kind of talks about that, is just kind of looking at the different vegetation types. So they've got projects throughout the Midwest where they're planting different vegetation plots throughout the array, and then taking a ton of measurements, um, rain, you know, 
They've got measurements all over the field to try to kind of quantify like what are the benefits to this vegetation, both to the solar array and to the surrounding environment. Um, and then one of the things Argonne is looking at is, is sort of the agricultural component. Um, so this is just an image that shows you, this was back in 2017, but it's all of the solar arrays that were built at that time. Um, and so the next slide is looking at, with those current solar arrays that were built in 2017, is like looking at pollinator dependent agricultural within one mile. And so this image is in hectares, um, but you can see that there is a huge impact even with the solar that's already installed if they were a pollinator. And this is only within one mile Typically, we kind of say that pollinators can have, can have an impact up to two miles. So I think this is quite conservative on the number of acres or hectares. Um, but it just shows you how large of an impact this could have. And it's just, I think that's all very clear. Um, but being able to quantify that in a real way that can help people understand like the additional like effort and dollars, I'm not really sure about yet. In my opinion, we're saving money long term. Um, but we also are owning projects for the life of them and can recognize those savings over the, you know, future years. Um, this is just something I think it kind of helps quantify like what this means um, in dollars and cents. And uh, if you just look at like the 1% yield, like we all in the California almonds, huge industry, just 1% yield increase is worth over $4 million. Um, and that's, that's pretty much, it's kind of mind blowing when you look at it that way. Similarly, Massachusetts and their cranberries is worth up to, you know, a little over a quarter of a million dollars for each 1% yield increase. Um, not to mention the cost of driving these bees all over the place at this point. Um, if any of you haven't heard the podcast about traveling bees and driving them all over the country, it's super fascinating. You should check it out. Um, oh, here. Sorry about that. I got a little click happy here. Um, so this is just, to put it all into perspective, I think what I, this is a estimate of a forecast of future development of solar. So 3 million acres will be developed into solar by 2030 and 6 million by 2050. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, and I don't think there's, we have no way of really understanding or quantifying those potential impacts, but there are a lot of people working on that right now. And I, I think we can all agree that using public money, or sorry, private money to restore up to 6 million acres is a huge potential of benefits for the environment and for the surrounding communities, agricultural, waterways, etc. cetera. Um, and so this is just a sort of a list of all, a lot of different groups that I've chatted with um, kind of just over the past few years who are all working on different approaches of their own. Um, and I, what else I want to say. Also, there's been a lot of businesses that have gotten super involved. They kind of mentioned like the beer um, earlier, um, Honey Bunch that's being developed out of Vermont. Um, Fresh Energy is that you mentioned with Rob Davis. They're working on a bunch of different aspects. They Gavin? recently released. Are you yeah. There? Go ahead. Did I lose you guys? Try again. Now I hear you. Okay. Internet might have gotten slow for a second. Um, but this is just like some of the business. There's a lot of businesses that are kind of getting involved. Cliff Bar is actually, you know, they've got super excited about this and have installed a solar array outside their manufacturing facility. Um, they're installing pollinator habitat and using that honey in a Cliff Bar. And I think there's just a lot of ways to get this out into like the mainstream um, to kind of help push it along as far as creating this in a real way um, because like, this is just an example none of us want to look at this right um, we'd all m much rather look at the next image if it will come up oh shoot we like images like this and so this is kind of the challenge that we're facing is that the expertise I guess pool available throughout the country is somewhat limited at this point um, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned and so this approach has really never tried to be has never been attempted at this scale um, and so it's it's been super challenging and that's kind of one of the things I've been talking with Tim about is like 
what NG is running into is we have sites throughout the country in every different climate and region. And so trying to find the best partners in different areas and also the best seeds and approach and keeping track of it all has been a bit challenging. And so we're, you know, we're doing our best kind of right now to try to develop like a national program that will give solar developers more of a one-stop shop of somewhere to go. Um, I'm working with external companies to help them build that in an effort to help us in the short term and then ultimately hoping that they can just market this to our, I mean, even our competitors. Because our goal is to make sure that, you know, hopefully this gets implemented on a larger scale. And if, you know, if we can help be a part of that, like that's super positive in our book. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're facing right now, but it all comes down to kind of getting public acceptance and more information out there about it. Um, and kind of also just trying to find ways to quantify this and measuring whether we're hitting certain milestones and like what counts as a pollinator friendly solar um, and just defining those things in a way that pushes companies and, and rewards them, I guess, for going above and beyond versus, you know, planting a strip of flowers along the front of an array or something. Um, so that's just kind of what I wanted to share with you guys. And I love it if you guys have any questions or want to chat through any of the specifics or challenges we run into. Thanks, Gavin. We already have a couple questions in the chat, so I'll, uh, I'll address those. Yes, the slides will be available. I already have a PDF, so I'll email that out tomorrow. And then we are recording this, so we'll even have uh, the video and audio of the presentation that Gavin gave. So, good question. Um, Gavin, do you know by chance the brand of that mowing equipment? I did do a quick, quick search on Google, and you can find videos of that product very easily, but I couldn't find the brand name. I don't off the top of my head. I believe it starts with a K, but I can find that out for you and get that information to you. Yeah, I talked to a guy at, at uh, Solar Power International last year who was selling that, and, and this is a vendor out of Indiana. I think he said it was made in Holland, but anyway, uh, yeah, the Europeans are a little further ahead of this, ahead of us on this, and um, so just know that there is uh, equipment available. And then um, Jonathan Roberts asks about the NREL uh, Inspire project. Um, Jonathan, we did have uh, a gentleman named Lee Walston on the show or on the group uh, back in July, and. I just forwarded uh, some slide or some some information that he had sent me, um, and I'll uh, forward that to the group as well. But uh, so we have a local contact with that study, and he's in the Chicago area at the Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, so he is he is actively looking for more study sites. So if you know solar developers that want to uh, participate in um, some, you know some public research, so to speak, uh, reach out to Lee Walston. There's a question from Andy about any tips for um, managing invasive species. He mentions spiny creeping thistle. Um, <laughs> but in general, yeah, invasives and weeds are, are, are going to be a challenge in uh, states like Illinois, where we have extremely fertile farm ground. Uh, any thoughts about that, Gavin? Yeah, um, so I, I definitely rely on the experts that we're using in different areas to, you know, on the specifics, but um, it all, a lot of it really comes down to the initial site prep, and there are definitely different methods for doing that depending on the amount of time you have. Um, there are more natural ways, there are chemicals that can be used to kind of get rid of these species, and it's going to be very specific to uh, the ones you're targeting. If it's a super stubborn sea species, but it's contained in an area, sometimes like it doesn't make sense to try to like fight it and you just kind of create barriers um, if, you, if you can seclude it into a small area. Because um, I still understand that we're all working within budgets, um, but a lot of it comes down to just making sure that you know, knowing specifically about the species that you're working with, because sometimes you can go out and you can just turn it over and diss the site and turning it over will take care of that species. Sometimes by doing that, you might kill that species, but then uproot a bunch of species that are buried previously. And that, that even comes with like the way that you install the seeds, whether you install by 
by grading the site, I am like um, by kind of ripping the site, or whether you drill it, or the different methods depending on the different species you're trying to avoid, um, will all have different impacts. Um, but yeah, we've run in, we've been through boot camp a little bit with all the distributed solar sites that we have because we have so many small sites in so many different locations um, that we run into every one that you've mentioned. So. <laughs> And then there's a question also from from Andy about um, how local landowners and farmers react to increasing the weed bank near their fields. So yeah, that is one of the uh, kind of social uh, impacts of pollinator friendly seed mixes is that they might be perceived as uh, a weed field. Um, has that been a factor for you guys? Yeah, that's actually an interesting thing because I've been, um, you know, the, talking with a few different, um, I guess, ecologists or experts. Uh, you know, and sometimes even whenever we have, a, I guess, a vegetation establishment that's quite successful, if it doesn't have enough flowering or forbs, um, there's definitely like that perception and so that is something we've taken into account a little bit um, to where we will potentially like there's a project in um, Nebraska for example that we kind of understand that the perception there is quite important and so we've had to really focus on making sure that there are sort of flowering forbs um, and throughout the season as well um, and so it, it comes down to kind of understanding I guess how important it is to the community or surrounding whether you know they visually believe something is pollinator friendly or you know i guess a healthy or impactful habitat with or without flowering plants i guess great well uh any other questions type them in or raise your hand i can unmute you I want to thank gavin again i am going to quickly share um my screen and uh i also wanted to let people know that jonathan roberts the vice president of development with uh soltage is going to be talking about developing a solar for uh solar portfolio in illinois challenges and opportunities that's coming up next week on the 17th all of these events are at seco.com solar webinar and then again, Rob Davis coming on the show, October 28th. Uh, the working group is gonna meet in two months. We're meeting every other month. So that puts us into November. And I think the date is November 14th, but that should be on the calendar invite. And you can find that information always at seco.com forward slash pollinators. We have all the meetings listed there now. Uh, there's also a place uh, it's a little uh, hidden, but if people need or want to get on the group, they can uh, fill out a little form there. So share that with your friends and colleagues. And just, I guess we don't have any other questions. So with that, I think we'll say thank you very much, everybody, and catch you in November. Thank you so much, Gavin. All right, thank you, guys. Take care, everybody.